The creation theme in Psalm 104, part two. We've been going along in the uh, uh, couple of books about the Genesis account of origins. Uh, the first one is called the Genesis creation account and its reverberations in the Old Testament. And the other one is he spoke and it was divine creation in the Old Testament. Uh, Joe Klingbeil edited both uh, volumes and uh, uh, the second is basically a, uh, a popularized version of the first. There are the covers. And we've been looking at chapter 5, the creation theme in Psalm 104, and we're finishing it up today. It's by Richard Davidson of Andrews University. And uh, a few introductory comments which I made last week as well, but I think bear repeating. There are those who use Psalm 104 to correct the Genesis account. Uh, the Psalm is allegedly earlier than the Genesis account, according to them, particularly Genesis 1. And I think that Davidson's article serves as a corrective to this line of reasoning. But Davidson aspires to be more than just a corrective. And uh, so we're going to look at what he has to say, the second part, and then uh, I'll give my reaction, and then you can give your reaction. Day 4, verses 19 through 23. The next section of Psalm 104, verses 19 through 23, provides a poetic interpretation of the fourth day of creation week as described in Genesis 1, 14 through 19. The psalmist does not feel the need that Moses did in Genesis 1 to use the circumlocution greater light for the term sun, Shemesh, or lesser light for the term moon, Yareach. Apparently, he was not worried that he might be misunderstood to describe deities when he gave the actual names for the celestial bodies. Um, another possibility is that when God wrote, Shemesh and Yareach were not in common use. And I think that God did, in fact, in fact write Genesis 1. Uh, the psalmist also does not follow the order in which the celestial bodies are presented in Genesis 1. Instead, he first refers to the moon and then the sun. He made the moon for the seasons. The sun knows the place of its setting, in verse 19. In the verses that follow, it is the night that is described first, described, verses 20 and 21, followed by the day, in verse 22. This seems to be the poet's way of highlighting the evening-morning sequence of the days of creation, without explicitly stating as much. Or perhaps it just felt, uh, fit into the feeling of the psalm. As in Genesis 1.14, for the psalmist, the moon exists for the purpose of making moadim, or seasons, in verse 19. But beyond this purpose, the night over which the moon rules is purposeful in the post-fall condition of the world to provide time for animals to prowl and seek their food. You appoint darkness and it becomes night in which all the beasts of the forest prowl about. The young lions roar after their prey and seek their food from God. Verses 20 through 21. Which is an interesting comment on ecology uh, that uh, apparently in the psalmist's mind, uh, the young lions are part of God's plan. Uh, even though in Genesis 1 you would think um, they originally ate a vegetarian diet, and certainly in the New Earth, they well, according to Isaiah. The night is for the animals, but the day is for the purpose of providing time for humans to labor. When the sun rises, they, that is the animals, withdraw and lie down in their dens. Man goeth forth to his work and to his labor until evening. The reference to human labor, abadah, from the verb abad, may hark back to the description of human labor, Abad, in the Garden of Eden, and particularly to the depiction of human labor outside the Garden in chapter 3, verse 23, showing that the psalmist was providing a poetic interpretation of Genesis 2 and 3 as well as Genesis 1. By the way, those who wish to separate Genesis 1 from Genesis 2 and 3, of course separating it at uh, verse 4, um, generally do accept that Genesis 2 and 3 are written by the same author. So that's not in dispute. And if you find something that is in Genesis 3 
uh, one can be reasonably sure that it is part of the Genesis 2 account uh, and, that, and, that, uh, and that no reasonable scholar will disagree with that particular point. Although the composer of Psalm 104 is selective in his use of materials from the Genesis creation accounts, it does not appear accidental or arbitrary that he omits any reference to the stars when dealing with the creation on the fourth day. As has been pointed out elsewhere, the grammatical structure of Genesis 1.16 implies that the stars were not created on the fourth day, but already existed before the commencement of creation week. By not mentioning the stars in this section of the psalm, this poet seems to lend further support to that conclusion. I'm not sure it's totally conclusive, but I think that it does kind of indicate that. Day 5, as will be pointed out, this psalm not only follows the sequence of the days of creation, but also reveals a chiastic symmetry among these days. The central verse of that chiasm is verse 24, in which the psalmist exuberantly extols Yahweh for his works of creation. O Lord, and of course that's uh, the English for Yahweh, how many are your works? In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. This verse looks both backward and forward in the psalm. Note the word works, which harks back to Psalm 104, 13 and forward to verse 31. So uh, works are used several times. And in a psalm, you can, I think it's fair to take those kinds of clues as indications of at least the, the uh, view of the author. Um, and may be seen as a transition between day four and day five. It links Yahweh's creation with wisdom. In a later inspired creation poem in Proverbs 8, which we will look at later, this wisdom will be set forth as a hypostasis for the divine Son of God, the pre-existent Christ, basically equivalent to the Logos, or as is translated commonly, the Word. Um, the Hebrew expression kinyan yekah, translated by the New England New American Standard Bible and some other verbs as your possessions in the context of the psalm, should probably be rendered your creatures, that is, the ones created, or better, your creations, again, highlighting the dominant creation theme of the psalm. While verse 24 is a central verse in the psalm, pointing both backwards and forwards, at the same time it is language that may be linked specifically to day five of creation and beyond. As Dukan points out, up till now the animals are mentioned merely in connection with the creation of the earth as inhabitants and the creation of the luminaries as their indications of daily life. Only from day five on are the animals concerned as created. Psalm 104 verses 24 through 26 focus on the fifth day of creation week in Genesis 1, during which God made the birds of the air and the inhabitants of the sea. The, bird, the creation of the birds is not explicitly mentioned in this section, perhaps because they've already been referred to twice in connection with the description of the purpose of vegetation on the third day. However, there is probably a subtle allusion to the birds in the intertextual echo between the rare Hebrew term kinyan, possessions, creature, or creation, which we just ran into, in verse 24, and a similar sounding rare Hebrew term Kanan, which is to make a nest in verse 17. And I, boy, that's uh, superscript 62. This echoing allows the psalmist in verse 24 by means of the alliteration to refer to the idea the former word conveys. This is common practice in Hebrew poetry. Without actually mentioning the birds in verse 24, the psalmist is able to allude to them in their building of nests by means of the alliterative, alliterative echo, echo between verses 17, verse 17 and verse 24. The main emphasis of this section is upon the creatures of the sea. Verse 25 provides an overview. There is the sea, great and broad, in which are swarms without number, animals both small and great. The poetic representation in this verse is short, but paucity of poetic lines is offset by their length. Verse 25 con constitutes the longest metrical line of the psalm, the only one that may be scanned with the unusually long metrical count of 4, 4, 3. Along with the fish, 
comes a somewhat surprising mention of ships, human-made vessels, in contrast with the works of God. There the ships move along, obviously not made by God, made by humans. However, the mention of ships is not so surprising when one realizes that the focus of this section is upon the things that move along there, Sham, repeated in verses 25 and 26, that is, in the sea. The psalmist describing the ongoing benefits of Creation Week does not hesitate to fill in the picture of the teeming life in the sea by notice, noting the movement of the ships. We'll come back to that point later. In the next breath, the psalmist describes the sea creature Leviathan, verse 26b. Although elsewhere in scripture, Leviathan is described in terms that are likely redeployed from ancient Near Eastern mythology, or perhaps share a common origin with Near Eastern mythology as a rebellious sea monster that has to be conquered and destroyed by God. Uh, for example, Psalm 74, 14 and Isaiah 27, 1. And again, that's a note 65. In this Psalm, Leviathan is depicted as one of the giant sea creatures which God formed to sport in it, that is the sea. This is reminiscent of the picture of Leviathan found in Job 41. It is a creature formed, Yasar, by God. I'm sorry, Yatsar. Um, in Genesis 2, 7 and 19, we learned that, the, um, that God formed Yatsar, Adam, the large land animals, the beasts of the field, and the birds. Now, from Psalm 104, 26, we learned that at least one of the sea creatures was also formed, Yatsar, by God. Furthermore, this verse tells us the purpose of God's creating Leviathan, namely, to sport or play, sahak, in the sea, a theology of divine play. And I'm not reading everything, but uh, um, land animals and human beings created on the sixth day, according to Genesis 1, 24 through 31, have already been mentioned in an ancillary way in earlier verses of Psalm 104, where the poet describes God's provision for their food. In this section, the psalmist refers back to that depiction. They all wait to you, for you to give them their food in due season. You give to them, they gather it up, you open your hand, they are satisfied, as in verse 13, with good, told. The word good, or tov, harks back to the repeated refrain in Genesis 1 and 2 that what God created was good, tov. In, uh, again, that's a, uh, a superscript 69. And in particular to the sixth day of creation where the term is used by God twice. It may also allude to Genesis 2.18 where Adam's existence without a partner was described as not good or Lo Tov. Remember, remember uh, uh, a while back we looked at Lo. Uh, and there, therefore, by implication, God's supplying him with a partner that is good. Or Tov. A crucial aspect of the sixth day emphasized by the psalmist in this stanza of Psalm 104 is God's giving life to humans and land animals by filling them with his breath, as described in Genesis 2.7. Uh, for Adam. In the same passage, he also alludes to the post-fall state of the world in which, the death, in which death occurs as God withdraws his spirit or breath from his creatures and they return to dust. And see the reference to Adam in Genesis 3, 19. You hide your face, quoting from the psalm, they are dismayed. You take away their spirit, they expire and return to dust. You send forth your spirit, ruach, and they are created, bara, and you renew the face of the ground. Both ruach and bara are words that occur in Genesis 1, repeatedly. The term bara, I'm sorry, bara, created, which um, describes the activity unique to God in effortlessly bringing into existence something totally new, is used in Genesis 1 and 2 particularly, although not exclusively to describe the creation of humans during the first creation week. But Psalm 104.30 shows that every creature on earth who has, ever, who has been born since that first creation week 
is the product of God's continued creative bara work. While Genesis 1 gives special place to humans in the creation account as having dominion over the animals, Psalms 104 emphasizes the similarity of all God's creatures having the breath of life. All are ultimately dependent on God for their life and sustenance. This stanza ends on a note of hope. You, that is Yahweh, renew the face of the ground. This phraseology is a reversal of the curse of Genesis 3.19. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread until you return to the ground. So suggesting that there is that there is continuing a renewal and that there may be a renewal in general later on. And of the destruction at the time of the flood, uh, Genesis 7.23, thus he blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the land. In his ongoing providential care for his creation, God continues to renew, that is, hadash, the face of the ground, that is, to replenish the surface of the earth, of the ground, with land animals and human beings. In day seven, as we've noted above, numerous scholars have recognized that Psalm 104 follows the same basic order as the six days of creation in Genesis 1. What is surprising about the analysis of these scholars, however, is not what is said, but what is overlooked. Kidner, H.C. Leupold, and others point out Psalm 104 parallels the six consecutive days of creation of Genesis 1. But in the commentary in the final verses of the psalm, verses 31 to 35, there is little attempt to connect this last section of the psalm with the Genesis creation account. Why is there this little recognition of the possibility that the last section of Psalm 104 might parallel the seventh day of creation, the Sabbath? Perhaps because they're not looking at the Sabbath that closely. Uh, fortunately, and these are my paraphrase of, uh, of uh, considerable verbiage, the Sabbath in Psalm 104 has been recognized by Delich. Delich labels this psalm the hymn in honor of the God of the seven days and summarizes its content as altogether an echo of the Heptahemeron, or history of the seven days of creation in Genesis 1. 1 through 2, 3, which you will rem recognize that he doesn't say six days of creation. Corresponding to the seven days, it falls into seven groups. This is Delish con uh, continuing. It begins with the light and closes with, as an, uh, with an allusion to the divine Sabbath. In the final section of the psalm, um, Verses 31 through 35, Delish finds a clear allusion to the Sabbath. The poet has now come to the end with the review of the wonders of, creation, of the creation and closes in the seventh group with a sabbatic meditation. Those ellipses, by the way, are uh, uh, Davidson's. This sabbatic meditation begins with the poet's wish. Let the glory of the Lord endure forever. Let the Lord be glad in his works. The psalmist wishes that the glory of God, which he had put, has put upon his creatures and which is reflected and echoed back by them to him, may continue forever and that his works may ever be so constituted that he who is satisfied at the completion of his six days work may be able to rejoice in them. Especially significant in linking this final stanza of the poem to the Sabbath is the close relationship between the reference to the poet's rejoicing in Yahweh verse 34, and the reference to Yahweh's rejoicing in creation. Between I will rejoice, verse 34, and he shall rejoice, verse 31, there exists a reciprocal relation as between the Sabbath of the creature in God and the Sabbath of God in the creature. There's also an eschatological implication of the sabbatical meditation in the poet's linkage of rejoicing in creation with the destruction of the wicked. When the psalmist wishes that God may have joy in his works of creation and seeks on his part to please God and to have his joy in God, he is also warranted in wishing that those who take pleasure in wickedness and instead of giving God joy to ex excite his wrath may be removed from the earth, for they are contrary to the purpose of the good creation of God. They imperil its continuance and mar the joy of his creatures. The link between the final stanza of Psalm 104 and the Sabbath of Genesis 2, 2 through 4 
it is finally receiving some attention in more recent scholarship. For example, without explicitly mentioning the Sabbath, Virg Virgil Howard states, the psalm empowers poet and hearer to imitate God by taking time to enjoy the creation. Such moments of resting in the creation are crucial not only for the human recreation, but also for the survival of the world itself, for it can entice one out of the mode of using and into the mode of revering. Dieter Schneider remarks concerning the concluding prayer of the psalm, just like God is experiencing the Sabbath joy over his creation, so the prayer will rejoice in Yahweh. Two Seventh-day Adventist scholars have called special attention to the Sabbath illusion in Psalm 104, 31 through 35. In his doctoral dissertation, Dukan points out that the thematic and terminological parallels between Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 4a and Psalm 104 as cited above. With regard to the relationship between the seventh day of creation week and Psalm 104, 31 through 32, he notes the thematic correspondence of the glory of God in creation and the allusions to the revelation on Sinai in verse 32, and then draws the implication, this reference to Sinai in direct association with the very concern of creation points to the Sabbath. You'll see that connection in a little bit. Dukan also points to the fact that both the introduction and the conclusion of Psalm 104, um, uh, verses 1 and 33 and nowhere else in the psalm, bring together the two names of God in Genesis 1, and two, Elohim, used alone only in Genesis 1, 1 and 2 to 2, 4, and together with the Tetragrammaton in Genesis 2, 4b to 25, and Yahweh, used with Elohim in Genesis 2, 4b through 25, which may imply the poet's recognition of the unity and complementarity of the two accounts of creation in Genesis 1 and 2. The other Adventist scholar to call particular attention to the Sabbath illusion in Psalm 104 is Shea. Shea elaborates on the parallel between the seventh day of creation week and the final verses of Psalm 104. In Genesis, the account of creation week goes on to describe the seventh day. The Psalm has, has something similar. On the Sabbath, we recognize that God is our creator. We honor him in the commemoration of creation. That is. The first thing mentioned in Psalms 104, 31. When God finished his creation, he said that it was very good. In Psalm 104, he rejoices in his works. Shea's major contribution to the Sabbath theology of 104 may be in drawing on the significance of what is described in the next word. He looks at the earth and it trembles. He touches the mountains and they smoke. Shea comments, this is the picture of a theophany, the manifestation of God's personal presence. This is what happens on the Sabbath when the Lord draws near his people and makes himself known. Struck with reverential awe, they render him worship. As Shea points out, the worship is depicted in the final verses of the psalm. I'll just comment here to notice that that's what happened at Sinai when the Ten Commandments were being given. Human beings bring worship and honor and glory and praise to God. This is not a one-time occurrence. The psalmist promises to carry on this activity as long as life lasts. The praise of the Lord are on the lips of the psalmist continually. Silence is another part of worship. Verse 34, the psalmist asks that silent meditation upon the Lord may be pleasing to God. Finally, this reflection upon worship ends with rejoicing in verse 35. There appears to be sufficient evidence to conclude with a high degree of probability that Psalm 104 not only refers to the first six days of creation week, but also in its final stanza, alludes to the seventh-day Sabbath of Genesis 2, 1 through 4a. Significant insights into Sabbath theology and praxis emerged from Psalm 104, 31 to 35, including themes of God's glorification and rejoicing in his created works. The theophanic presence of God, leading to reverential awe and exuberant singing and praise and worship of God, meditation upon and joy in the Lord, and the wish prayer for an eschatological end of the wicked who refuse praise. I'm sure that should be refused to praise God, although that's the original, at least uh, the electronic version. Um, the chiastic symmetry among the days of creation. 
The inspired composer of Psalm 104 not only structures his composition in the sequence of the days of creation, but also sets forth a symmetrical arrangement among these days. The chiastic structure of Psalm 104, as it has emerged from the, my study of the psalm, may be schematically diagrammed like this. The first part starts with, bless the Lord, O my soul, the inclusio, and then day one, and then day two, and then day three, and then day four, and by the, the day four you have kind of the middle, and that's uh, an exaltation. And then day five matches day three, and day six matches day two, and day seven matches day one in the psalm. And then finally we have the inclusio with kind of the, the final word is hallelujah, praise the Lord. A Theology of Psalm 104 and its Adjacent Psalms. Two major theological themes, Creatio Prima and Creatio Continua. And of interest, uh, uh, in the original in Genesis, Creatio Prima seems to be the only theme. So Psalm 104 is combining the original creation with God's continual creation. Two terms that stand out in bold relief in Psalm 104 are works or made, ma'asa and asa, which are obviously related words, and satisfy or sabah. These um, constitute the two main theological points of the psalm, God's initial work of creation and his continual satisfying or, satisfying or providing for his creation. While other biblical creation accounts, such as Genesis 1, focus upon God's initial creation, Psalm 104 is virtually unique in emphasizing God's continuing creation. And I'm going to skip over a little bit. Historicity and literality of the Genesis creation narratives. After affirming the theological importance of Psalm 104 as a creation text, Miller joins others who have argued that since the psalm is written in poetry, its report of creation, or that of Genesis 1 through 2 either, is not to be interpreted literally as really having happened as described. Here, Psalm 104, however, there's no external report vulnerable to literal and scientific analysis. One cannot analyze Psalm 104 that way. It is poetry, and we know not to interpret poetry literally. And I think they do have a point. Uh, however, Hebrew poetry does indeed contain an abundance of imagery, which must be recognized and interpreted as such, but it is incorrect to include that after taking into account the obvious imagery involved, Hebrew poetry should not be interpreted literally. Quite the contrary. In the Hebrew Bible, the poetic genre does not negate a literal interpretation of the events described. For example, Exodus 15, uh, Daniel 7, and some 40% of the Old Testament, which is in poetry. In fact, uh, and I would add to that probably uh, uh, the story of Deborah has the song of Deborah after it, and the song is obviously not intended to destroy the, the meaning of the story, and in fact adds a few details that are probably accurate. Um, in fact, biblical writers often write in poetry to underscore what is literally and historically true. The poetic representation of the seven days of creation in Psalm 104 does not negate the literality and historicity of the Genesis creation week any more than the poetic rep uh, representation of J the Exodus in Psalm 105 and 106 negates the literality and historicity of the Exodus events or the poetic representation of the Babylonian captivity in Psalm 137 negates the literality and historicity of the exile. Just because you make a poem about it doesn't mean it's suddenly all mythical. Purposefulness, beauty, and joy of creation. Psalm 104 not only assumes and builds upon the literality of the Genesis creation accounts, but reaffirms and amplifies the sense of orderliness and purposefulness that emerges from Genesis 1 and 2. Everything is created in wisdom, in an orderly way, and has its purpose. The psalm also underscores and develops the sense of beauty and pleasure that God's orderly, purposeful creation brings, not only to his creatures, but also to God himself. 
This is already implied in Genesis 1 as God proclaims his works, good and beautiful, the meaning of the Hebrew told. But it comes to, into full expression in, in the exquisitely wrought turns of phrase and plenitude of imagery in Psalm 104, climaxing with the exclamation, let the Lord be glad in his works. This aesthetic, pleasurable quality of God's creation also contains an element of joy. Note the threefold use of samah, be glad, in verses 15, 31, and 34b, and even playfulness, the Hebrew sahak, sport or play, in reference to the Leviathan of verse 26. Postfall perspective. At the same time, Psalm 104 often describes God's created world from the perspective of how it functions after the fall. In other words, how the psalmist experienced it. And incidentally, how we experience it. Notice, for example, the reference to rainfall from God's upper chambers in verse 13 in contrast to the mist that rose from the ground in pre-fall Eden. The existence of predatory activity on the part of the animals in contrast to the original vegetarian diet of all animals, the cultivation of the earth by humans at labor, in contrast to the pre-fall ten tending and keeping of trees and plants in the Garden of Eden, and the existence of sinners and wicked people who need to be consumed, in contrast to a perfect world without sin in the pre-fall Eden. And I think ships fall into that category. These references of the psalmist are not to be taken as contradicting the picture presented in Genesis 1 and 2. They are in keeping with the psalmist's poetic strategy to blend his depiction of the seven days of creation week with the view of God's continued preservation in its post-fall condition. I'm sorry. The psalmist does not teach death and predation before sin, as some have claimed. Human interdependence and integration with the rest of creation one especially surprising theological feature of the psalm comes in its, its depiction of humans within the scheme of creation. Unlike Psalms 8, which builds upon Genesis 1, 26 and 28 and emphasizes humanity's God-given dominion over the rest of creation, Psalm 104 emphasizes that all sensate beings with whom God has created, whom God has created, share this world together. There's a clear distinction between humankind and the different animals, but they are talked about in parallel ways as creatures of the world God has made. Humankind not only as assumes a central, a special place, pardon me, humankind assumes not a central, a special place, but an integral part of the whole. Thus there is no language of domination, no imago dei, that sets human beings apart from, or puts them in rule over the other beasts. While bypassing all the complex issues of the interrelationships among these um, creatures, the psalm assumes a world in which they are all present, all in their place, all doing their work, and all provided for by God's goodness. Psalm 104 does not deny the mo model of domination that is highlighted in Genesis 1 and Psalm 8, but it stresses what might be called the model of integration. Harrelson goes even further than the integration when he describes this in the intrinsic importance of other created beings apart from humankind. I know of no more direct word in the Bible about the inter independent significance of things and creatures on which man does not depend for life. God has interest in badgers and wild goats and storks for their own sakes. He has in interest in trees and mountains and rocks, cairns that simply serve non-human purposes. God cares for his earth. Ecological concerns. The study is not the place to develop the ecological concerns of the psalm. Of, and that's uh, footnote 100. But it must be noted that the psalm describes the interdependence of natural phenomena in such a way as to highlight what we today speak of in ecological terms. And I'm going to skip over the next three paragraphs. Um, Theological connections with adjacent psalms. Psalm 103 and 104. Uh, here, we underscore major thematic connections implied by the juxtaposition of these two psalms. Psalm 104 expresses poetic praise to Yahweh as creator and preserver of creation. Psalm 103 ex expresses thanksgiving to Yahweh for his compassion, his mercy, and his forgiveness. Psalm 
Thus the celebration of God's creation and his steadfast love, or hesed, belong together. Both God's creation and preservation of his mercy and forgiveness are aspects of Yahweh's manifold works, ma'asim, the things that he has done. Um, creation cannot be separated from salvation history. There's also a strong terminological linkage between Psalm 104 and 105. Both Psalms end with the Hebrew word hallelujah, or praise the Lord. Uh, mo most striking are the three key terms, which occur in the very same order at the end of Psalm 104 and at the beginning of Psalm 105. Zamar, sing, Sia. Meditate and samach, be glad or glory in. This is the only place in the entire Bible where such combination of terms is repeated in the same sec sequence. These linkages invite us to see the theological connections between the two Psalms. They're related to each other. Psalm 105 and its complement, Psalm 106, carry forward the theme of salvation history found in Psalm 103, but on the national level as they encompass the high points in Israel's entire history as a nation. As they bring back, as they bring book four of the Psalter to a close, they call for praise of Yahweh for his wonders, Nipleot. The creation of Psalm 104 is enfolded in the bosom of salvation history that surrounds it in Psalm 103 and Psalm 105 to 106. So both creation and salvation or judgment are revelations of the same wonderful, gracious, good God. Salvation in this particular case in context is salvation from Egypt, but in a, in a higher sense, salvation from sin as well. Um, both creation and salvation or judgment are revelations of the same wonderful, gracious, good God. Both call forth spontaneous praise from the worshiper. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Hallelujah. This call to praise may be viewed as one of the main purposes, if not the primary one, of all these psalms. Synthesis and conclusion. In conclusion, it may be helpful to synthesize significant details of Psalm 104 that reaffirm, amplify, or further contribute to questions of origin set forth in Genesis 1 and Two, which we have summarized under the four headings suggested by Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. The when, in the beginning, the who created, pardon me, God, the how created, and the what, the heavens and the earth. Plus a fifth category underscored uniquely in Psalm 104 as the why of creation. The when of creation, under the question of when, Psalm 104 affirms that the absolute beginning of creation is a direct act of God in parallel with the interpretation of Genesis 1-1 as an independent clause. The psalm explicitly indicates, for example, that the tehom, the deep, which is described in connection with the unformed, unfilled condition of the earth in Genesis 1-2, is created by God. You covered it, that is, the earth, with the deep as with a garment. Psalm 104 also assumes the seven-day seven -day creation week as the entire psalm systematically moves through the activities of each day as described in Genesis 1 including the Sabbath on the seventh day. As argued above, this creation week is assumed to be literal, even though the interpretation of Genesis 1 and 2 is given in poetic form. That is, in Psalm 104 it is. The evening and morning rhythm of each day also seems to be implied by reference to the creation of the moon before the sun and the night before the day. Verses 5 through 9 of Psalm 104 seem to lend support to a two-stage creation for the raw materials of this earth, land and water. The first stage before the beginning of creation week, during which time the foundations of the earth were laid, mountains were formed and all was covered by the watery deep. And the second stage on the third day of creation week, during which time mountains rose and valleys sank, allowing dry land to appear from amid the receding deep, forming earth and seas. As with Genesis 1, Psalm 104 places the appointment of the sun and moon for seasons in the midst of creation week, not at the beginning, and clarifies what is not explained in Genesis about the source of the light before day four, namely the light with which God clothed himself. Um, 
and I think that should read, although it doesn't, uh, Psalm 104, 1b and 2a. The lack of reference to the stars in verse 19 through 23, which described the celestial luminaries, may imply what is suggested also in Genesis 1, that the stars were not created during the creation week, but were already in existence before that time. By blending into a seamless whole the account of creation week with the present conditions of the earth after the fall, moving effortlessly and almost unnoticeably from the time of origins to the present, the psalmist may be implying relative temporal continuity between the past and present. That is a relatively recent and not a remote creation. I find no implication, however, of a process of theistic evolution linking past and present. There's an eschatological perspective within the when of creation. Psalm 104.5 gives a promise that the earth and its foundations will not totter forever and ever. There's assurance that this planet will never cease to exist. Furthermore, from a post-flood perspective, the psalmist indicates that the waters which once covered the earth but were assigned their boundaries will not return to cover the earth. Verse 30 seems to point beyond the present life-death cycle to the future. You send forth your spirit there created, and you renew the face of the ground. As Deisler correctly observes, God's final ordering word does not apply to death, but to life. The final verse, verse 30, cor corroborates the future-oriented view, which points to the renewal of the present, while the old is not destroyed, but transformed. The language of verses 24 through 30 may actually imply the eschatological resurrection of marine and terrestrial creatures. If marine creatures are resurrected, then you can be confident your dog will come back too. Um, with regard to Genesis 1.1, it has been suggested that the term Bereshit in the beginning was deliberately chosen by Moses to rhyme with Beharit in the last days, in Genesis 49, 1, Numbers 24, 14, and Deuteronomy 31, 29, in order to illustrate the eschatological perspective of the Torah from the very first verse. Personally, I would uh, rather rephrase that, that the other three were perhaps chosen to rhyme with Bereshit. But I guess that's one's perspective. Uh, in similar fashion, the psalmist in Psalm 104 depicts a perfect world created by God and ends his poetic meditation with a wisp prayer, let sinners be consumed from the earth and let the wicked be no more. He looks forward to the day when all who have marred the perfect creation will be gone and the earth can once again fully reflect God's original intention in his creation. The who of creation, as to the who of creation, the psalmist reaffirms that God the creator is both Elohim of Genesis 1 and Yahweh, Elohim of Genesis 2 and 3. See the use of both names for God in verses 1, 24, 31, and 45. For the psalmist, both Genesis creation accounts belong together in a part and parcel of the same narrative. The creator is both the all-powerful transcendent one, the meaning of Elohim, and the personal imminent covenant God, the implications of the name Yahweh. As in Genesis 1 through 3, the God of creation is presented in the psalm as one, of the, as one of moral goodness, full of tender care for the creatures he has made, in contrast to the deities of nations surrounding Israel, who are often depicted as cruel and capricious. Yahweh is presented as the one God, besides whom there is none other. But at the same time, there is mention of Yahweh's spirit being sent forth, perhaps as an intimation of more than one person of the Godhead little stretch, but it could, it could fit. The how of creation, regarding the how of creation, Psalm 104 reaffirms the statements of Genesis 1 and 2, that God creates, bara, a term which describes exclusively God's action and refers to effortlessly producing something totally new, in contrast to the common ancient Near Eastern views of creation by sexual procreation or by a struggle with the forces of chaos. The psalm also uses other words for creation found in Genesis 1 and 2, asa, to make, plus the related noun maase, works, which is not found in Genesis 1 and 2, yatsar, to form, like a potter, Psalm 104, 26, used in God's forming the sea creature Leviathan, 
whereas in Genesis it only refers to the first human and to the larger land animals, and nata, pardon me, nata, to plant of the cedars of Lebanon. Uh, compare Genesis 2.8 and God's planting of the garden. And to skip over some other stuff, the primary principles understand, underlying how God created, both in Genesis 1 and 2, and Psalm 104 is that of separation. In Genesis 1 and 2, we find the term separate in verses 4, 6, 7, 14, and 18. The first one being God separated the light from the darkness. And uh, moving on, uh, talking about the Egyptian hymn to Aten. In fact, the sun is mentioned only once, only in one verse of the psalm. And it figures as a mere creature, a cogwheel in the well-ordered cosmos designed by Yahweh. Yahweh is the master of the sun as he is of the storm, which is contrary to Baal being the, the uh, master of the storm. The what of creation, and I'm just skipping over that, and the why of creation. The the what of creation in Psalm 104, especially in its climactic allusion to the Sabbath, actually moves from the question of what to the question of why, only hinted at in Genesis 1 and 2. In Genesis 2, 1 through 3, God sanctified the seventh day, and from elsewhere in Scripture we learn that God makes something holy by his presence. Compare the burning bush or the sanctuary. Hence, this suggests that the Sabbath is a time when God enters into an intimate personal relationship with his creatures, a time when his creatures can worship him in, with joy and praise. The climax of creation in Genesis 1 and 2 is thus a call to praise and worship. In Psalm 104, creation more explicitly calls the reader to the same responses in Genesis 1 and 2, joyful worship and praise of the Creator. How appropriate that this psalm concludes with the first hallelujah found in the Psalter. Now my take on this is that Davidson has done a good, done a good job in showing that Psalm 104 can be compatible with a pre-existing creation account. I, I would be more explicit in arguing that the poetic nature of Psalm 104 makes it difficult to take the psalm as normative over Genesis 1 and 2, in particular, uh, the lions finding their prey are not part of the original creation any more than the ships in the sea are. And there are those who have used Psalm 104 to try to argue that the lions finding their prey were part of the original creation. I think that's a mistake. Um, thus, for example, I'm reluctant to say that Psalm 104 settles the question about the light of the first three days, although I would say it, it can give evidence. However, the Genesis account forms the background for Psalm 104, and thus the psalmist, presumably David, had an awareness of that account, which means that the psalm, uh, which means that the Genesis account was not some late addition, that it started out early. The Genesis account forms an important background for the Psalms in general, and particularly Psalm 104. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Do you have a comment back in the back there? Are we assuming that the Hebrews were monotheistic? I think that, um, that one can assume at least that they were henotheistic and probably it's a reasonable assumption that they were monotheistic at this time. As, as, the, I, uh, as I hear this, it sounds like God did everything, but in the New Testament it implicitly implies all the action to Jesus. And the Holy Spirit doesn't seem to, uh, except for hovering, doesn't seem to do anything. That's uh, uh, did they? They didn't have a Trinitarian uh, concept. No, I don't think they had an explicit Trinitarian concept, and I think it would be hard to have one if you haven't seen the life of Jesus. Uh, you know, God is God. God will be a man someday. Uh, God is also spirit, but you do have, you do have kind of the spirit of God being something special. And as we will see um, in another chapter of the book, 
uh, the wisdom literature, and in particular uh, Proverbs chapter 8, has a long section about how wisdom was with God in the beginning uh, with his works of creation. Um, and again, John se uh, the Gospel of John seems to take that theme straight over into the Greek, where it talks about the Logos that was with God and was God. So what you see is, a, I think, a dim prefiguring. And in fact, in Genesis 1, uh, describing the creation of man, there's a very odd uh, way of putting things. And it says, let God, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Very clearly, um, first person plural. And then it goes on to describe, and God made man in his image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Those are all parallel, implying that male and female is the image of man, or is the existence of man, and also that it is the image of God. Suggesting that there is a, at least duality, and probably plurality because of the way it's phrased. There is actually a dual form in Hebrew. And what is used is a plural, which kind of suggests three or more. And now, it is not so obviously there that it can't be kind of overlooked as a poetic way of expressing things or uh, you know, plural of majesty or something like that. And, you know, the Jews who read this all the time, um, generally speaking, don't come to the conclusion that this is an, an, an indication of plurality within the Godhead. There is a text, I think in Galatians, they use the Greek word boule as counsel, where it seems that the Godhead was given in a way to enhance our understanding. In other words, Jesus being the Son of God, the Holy Spirit being an entirely different person with different activities. Yeah. But, um, uh, but to get back to it, in, in a text that was used uh, uh, today in church, um, the... Uh, there's the famous Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Ahad. Which the Ahad can, you know, can look at a, a unity that is not necessarily indi not individualized, you know, um, but a unity that is, uh, that can be of, of different uh, uh, different entities united in one purpose. Um, and that echoing, that echoes the uh, prayer of Jesus when he asked for us to be united with him as he is with God. You may remember that in John 17. Um, again, uh, it's not so obvious that it couldn't be denied. Um, but there are hints there that suggest that possibility. We have a comment over here. We, you get two microphones here. <laughs> My brother-in-law wanted me to ask this. I missed last week, so I probably could have answered it. But here was his, uh, he says, Psalms 104 talks about the whole earth being covered by water. I was wondering if it was only talking about the flood or was that prior to God's creative actions? Um, as Davidson is reading the psalm, and I'm sympathetic to his reading, that's actually referring to creation because the whole psalm is, in fact, creation. Mm -hmm. And that what was happening was the, uh, the flood was God temporarily erasing the whole thing. And, 
By the way, it, it would lend it would lend some uh, credence to the idea that when you're reading uh, "Never Cover the Earth Again," uh, there might be some dispensations where, or a dispensation at least, where that could happen. So, um, and and that means that if you're going to do that with Psalm 104. At least with the poetic passages, and maybe even with the prose, you need to be careful about leaning too hard on those kinds of things. The earth will never be moved. But, you know, then again, there's a new heavens and a new earth coming, which implies that the old is going to be somehow completely revamped. And so. Uh, the foundations will not totter well until God decides they're not going to totter. Uh, and in fact, you've, you will find uh, you will find expressions to of that effect. Uh, like, will a mother leave her offspring? Well, yeah, they may, but I won't. Uh, implying that you know, in general, it's true. And in exceptional cases, it's not true, but uh, but God's faithfulness is beyond those exceptions. Nick. Uh, the, there's a couple of Seventh-day Adventist theologians or uh, professors who are writing a book about Genesis. Uh, Brian Bull and uh, Fritz Guy, and they are suggesting that maybe the flood was a local uh, uh, event in the Middle, Middle East. And their arguments seem to make sense, uh, you know, on the surface. But this week I was uh, in a website by non Adventist. And they are saying, how can that be? Because why would God direct Noah to build an ark if the, if the flood was a local event, then there was no need for an ark because the animals and saving the animals. Because if it was a local event, you know, the animals from the rest of the world would repopulate the earth with animals. So what's the purpose of building an ark in, uh, large enough and you know, all the work of trying to save the animals from death? What do you think about that argument? Well, I would agree with that. Um, uh, well, we have another comment down here in a minute. But I would agree with that uh, argument, and, and in fact, it's even worse for the birds because they can just fly away. Uh, uh, why, why build an ark for the birds? You know, uh, the, the, I did this one time because there was, a, there was a guy who was promulgating a similar theory on a um, um, uh, listserv kind of thing. You know where they send emails to everybody uh, on this, and uh, the uh, the gentleman was proposing that the that the Black Sea flood was the flood of Genesis. It happened a long time ago. Mm, if you adjust the uh, historical parameters, you can kind of you know wiggle them to make them fit. Uh, you have to stretch them a little bit, but you know. And uh, so I said, well, let's see. What part of this are we going to believe? Are we going to believe there was a guy named Noah? Are we Are going to believe that there was an ark? Uh, we're going to let the birds go, except maybe chickens, because they can't fly too fast. And so what we're going to do is we're going to put him on an island in the middle of this. okay? And the Black Sea flood comes up and covers the island. After what seemed about a year, why he... Uh, he uh, uh, left, uh, you know, found land somehow, left the ark, and repopulated his little area of the world, which at that time didn't have enough humans for him to make contact with anybody else. Okay, 
So, you know, you can kind of push that story if you want to. Uh, well, then what you should say is that you should look for an island that had a human population on it, and that, or a, or a sub, submerged island, I should say, right? And in fact, if you want to be precise, it should be about 15 cubits or 22 and a half feet below the surface of the modern uh, late, uh, uh, Black Sea. And he um, showed no particular interest in trying to find such an island. <laughs> in fact, uh, he took it as a little offensive to, to push the story hard enough to, to look for that kind of an island. What you're seeing is people trying to, people trying to shoehorn the flood into the world as science has taught them to view the world. And, and you're right. You can get some pieces to fit, but in order to do it, you know, in order to fit that square peg into a round hole, you have to kind of chop off some corners. Wasn't Noah warned how long before the flood? 120 years. That's long enough to make a migration out of the area. You would think. <laughs> you would think that it would be far simpler to just move over. Move over out of the way of whatever flood is coming. 120 years of warning should be sufficient for anybody. <coughs> That's another of the details that this guy chopped out. Because 120 years again, you, you expect him to be able to, you know, kind of ferry him and his, uh, his cohorts out of that island by 120 years. When you realize the Black Sea Flood, although it sounds like a you know, huge, gigantic event, and in one sense was, it wasn't something that hit people fast. The water would be rising. Um, I've forgotten it about like uh, a, ten, uh, a foot a day or something like that. It's, it's, not, it's not very fast. It's not as, uh, maybe it's uh, five feet a day, but it's not, you know, it's not the kind of thing that that should preclude you from being able to, to uh, easily maneuver around. It, it took a year to fill up the Black Sea. And I, I've forgotten how deep the Black Sea is, but you could, you, know, you could do some calculations as to how much time it took. Now, I think there was a Black Sea flood, don't get me wrong. Uh, and in fact, there's some evidence that the channel was cut considerably deeper and that there's a, you know, there's a spillway effect when the Black Sea flooded. And in fact, the same is true probably for the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean started out dry and, and water from the Atlantic came in. There have been some major floods. And one of the things that's interesting is we're discovering floods all over now that we know that we should be looking for them. Uh, there, are, there are places in the English Channel where they've done sonar of the, of the bottom and you can see features that are highly reminiscent of the features that are found uh, currently in the state of Washington where the Brett's flood took over. And, it, and, and so the cut between Dover and Calais was actually catastrophic. The North Sea being filled up, probably dammed partly by, uh, by ice and uh, and possibly dammed partly by soft chalk uh, sediment, uh, having suddenly spilled over its banks and, and cut stuff in the English Channel. Maybe one of these days I'll bring that, uh, that evidence here and you can look at it. Uh, but uh, uh, floods are all over the place. Uh, but trying to make the Black Sea flood into Noah's flood you really have to do a lot of shaving of the account in order to make it fit. Uh, comment here and then there. Yeah. Uh, not just that, but uh, the Genesis account is so extremely all-inclusive. Mm 
talks about all creatures under the whole heavens, the water covering the whole earth. Uh, why, why try and uh, force the flood into uh, something that is not what the Bible describes? Well, you know why. <clears throat> it's a 600-pound gorilla. Sure. I mean, uh, <laughs> the, uh, without the flood, you cannot explain the geological uh, layers and so well, on. Well, if you have long, long age, and if, if the geological layers <clears throat> represent long I mean, periods we, of time, I mean, then you can't have a flood. Well, within the context of a six-day creation. Yeah. Or within the context of uh, any truth to the Bible, we might say almost. Yeah. The uh, so you, you've got that, but I would say uh, in addition to that, uh, <clears throat> how are you going to explain uh, those geological layers out there? You have to give up the six-day creation if you're going to start talking about the Mediterranean flood. And God says, "I did it in six days." Is God a liar? What are we doing with? Uh, with God when we're starting these stories about a local flood. Well, equivalently, um, what we're saying is, is Moses a liar? Um, or whoever made up the story that's attributed to Moses, is, are they liars? And, of course, and there's a reluctance to call it that because when you do that, you suddenly realize that they have, in fact, cut themselves off from the biblical record. But, um, but that's what is being said. And in fact, all of the Old Testament scholars, you know, you can quote them again and again, is saying the, the story intended to be believed as written. These days, what, they're, what they're really beginning to start saying is that, yes, but they didn't understand. They didn't know. They didn't think well enough. They didn't see everything that they should have, that we now see and understand. In other words, we're the only ones who know what's going on, and the previous sages, nobody understood anything. That's basically what is being now used as the argument why we can discount whatever anybody in history said. Well, you know what it reminds me of? The claim that was made when I was 20 or so by, uh, I think it was Abby Hoffman, never trust anybody under 30, or over 30. And of course, Abby Hoffman then became 30, and then he wanted to make the, uh, an exception for himself. But anyway. Yeah. <clears throat> it, I'm sure many of you know and are following what's happening in the Antarctic after the Arctic lost its uh, summer ice cover. And um, I have a friend who's doing his uh, dissertation in Oxford, but he's taken a tangent at the moment to do a 600-page thesis on uh, what's the real age of the Ice Age, and he thinks it's under 100,000 years. And before that, about, probably about 15 years ago, I had a nephew who went three seasons in a row while working on his dissertation uh, to the Antarctic to look at the melting. Now you have, for instance, the Dutch government having made a decision only to build the dikes around Rotterdam and Amsterdam and to abandon their farmlands. They're saying it's impossible. And of course in London you have a huge tidal wave system that's been put in to protect the Thames and all the um, major works are now considered insufficient for the rising of the sun, um, so rising of the waters because they say we've got perhaps 20 years at the very most when the sea levels will rise so that most of Bangladesh will be covered by the sea, and so on and so on. So now we have here in Psalm 104, supposedly the oldest, and I don't believe it is, but supposedly the oldest story of creation. And in there is contained the promises that the sea, the sea will not cover the earth. And then we say, well, how does uh, the, the actual story of Noah fit into this? Um, do the promises of God only come into effect not to destroy the earth by the sea after the flood, only because we see the rainbow? Or are even those only pertinent to some islands? In other words, should we realistically start expecting that the earth may indeed be major portions covered by the sea? I'm wondering if there's any clarity in this. Do we really know that Psalm 104 promises are only post-flood? Because if they're pre-flood, if they're built into the creation story, 
then the flood story tells us we better be building a Noah's Ark again. Well, uh, I don't think so, and I'll tell you why. Um, we may wind up having to abandon uh, certain low-lying areas because the sea rises up enough. Um, I'm, I'm not sure we're at that point yet, and I think the, the Dutch government may be trying to get ahead of the curve and maybe mistaking where the curve is going. But um, uh, in any case, uh, uh, let's supposing that they, that, that um, the sea rose by, you know, 200 feet, so we'll be catastrophic about it. Uh, a, a large share of the Floridian Peninsula will disappear. Um, even Amsterdam and Rotterdam wouldn't be able to be protected by dikes. I mean, 200 foot dikes is really dicey. Um, uh, uh, there would be a large number of, of, uh, of places where uh, one, would, one would lose fairly large cities because cities tend to be, um, many, many of the major cities, uh, I mean not Denver and places like that, but, uh, but uh, many of the major cities tend to be on the coastline. <laughs> but what would happen is people would just move 200 uh, feet up and build the cities all over again. I mean, that's what happened. There are sunken cities now where the sea has risen over them. You know, uh, that kind but, of process. But, but such may be because the ground dropped, like you have the huge rift valley from, you know, the Dead Sea all the way through the Serengeti and further down south. I mean, that's a phenomenal drop that has occurred. And when you stand, for instance, in Ethiopia over the cliff of it, your knees buckle because the drip drop is so dramatic. So there has been a huge, and I would imagine many of those cities, that's what happened to them. Now, I mean, where I live myself at the moment, half the season, uh, the ground is still rising uh, just under a centimeter a year. But we can actually dig into our garden and find man-made evidence, yet we are two miles from the sea at the moment. Now, if the sea rises only like eight meters, we're completely covered by water. We have nothing to recover. And when we push in, what have you got? You've got four or five million people all crowding in what would be supposedly a new potential area of coastline. I mean, yeah. The, the well, you, you know, I mean, and people are, there, um, are not always forward thinking, and I can't tell you how many people live, for example, in the Mississippi floodplain. Sure. Because it's fertile ground. It's right next to the Mississippi where you can, you know, have your barges pick up your goods and take them up the river, down the river. Yeah. But I would imagine that we better be warning our evangelists not to start preaching too much about the rainbow. Because relatively speaking to the majority of the population in the world who live near the sea, they are all in danger unless we are convinced that God really meant there would be no major significant destruction of human habitations. And I don't know that we really have clear theology on that. Well, I don't, I don't know that we should have clear theology on that. I, I think that God doesn't always promise everything that we'd like to think we do. There, you know, there are, uh, for example, there are many people who cling to the promise, and I think it's an important one in general, that if you train up the child in the way he should go, whatever that means, and we've gone over that, uh, in some detail, uh, that when he's old he will not depart from it. But I, what that, if you took that absolutely literally, what it means is that if you do the right parenting job, your kids will never uh, become non-Christians, they'll never become non-Adventists, uh, they will never become, uh, they will never turn away from God. And that's, that is just too much of a burden to put on parents because, you know, they, and sometimes we say, well, you know, uh, when his old does not depart from it, maybe in middle age he will, um, but uh, yeah, but I mean, you then, can get away with he that. He may not live to be old, you sure. know. So yeah, I, mean, I mean, but you can partially cover that by because God Himself lost His first grandson, grandson as a murderer. Yeah. In other words, Adam failed, but Cain became a murderer. So, you know, parents should take it that you know it doesn't always work out even for the super God Father. 
So the point, but, but the point I'm saying is, do we have an assurance from Scripture? And if Psalm 104 was written before the flood, then we surely don't have it from there. Well, do we have assurance that God is going to ensure that this earth is not going to be dramatically, in major, major portions of the human population, are not going to be destroyed or their homelands aren't going to be destroyed by water? Can we say that? Uh, no, and I I'm don't beginning think we to can. Think we can't say that. So what's the rainbow up there for? The rainbow is, uh, is an assurance that God will never cover the entire earth. So it, we either don't believe another, that another, or... Uh, De Denver is safe. Yeah, but I mean what Nick was saying about this research, then those people don't even believe that. Because why would God say, I'll never destroy the whole earth, if he never has? Perhaps he hasn't even got the ability. So either we accept the, the rainbow as being a serious thing that we can sure and crusade in Bangladesh and tell the people, don't worry, God is not going to destroy your earth, or we say to them, hey, look, with our help, let's move you to the mountains. I mean, it, it's as, it, you know, if you look at the scale of what's expected, it is well, horrendous. Well, Los, the whole of Los Angeles will go apart from a few hilltops. Yeah. The well, water will be actually coming down the, 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 the uh, interstate ted. Well, there, there's, another, there's, a, there's another point that is to be made, and that, is that, uh, and that is that when you run out of Antarctic ice um, and Greenland ice, you're done. And in fact, the ice that's floating on water doesn't count because that ice already displaces water. It's only the ice that's on land and that could be melted off. And there isn't enough to put it, I mean, 200 feet and you're done because that's that's everything melted off. Uh, the other thing to say is that while the, um, while the Arctic is losing, uh, and again, the, the, ice in the, the ice in the Arctic Ocean doesn't count either because it's floating. But the ice in Greenland does, and the ice in, in Antarctica does. The interesting thing is while Greenland is losing ice, um, Antarctica is not. It's actually gaining ice. No, the latest reports are horrendous. The size of, uh, what did they say it was, the size of New um, Mexico or whatever is being uh, uh, about to collapse completely into the water because the ice has melted from underneath already. Well, I, I would like to see those because I haven't seen them. But uh, I'll the, send the you ones them. I saw I'll send you the were, links. And the ones I there. saw said that the Antarctic was actually gaining ice. No, it's and not possibly gaining because, ice. Possibly because at that time, and it, and it may change with time too, possibly because at that time there was, it was, warmer to a point actually increases snow because you can get more water into the air um, so that I'm not uh, but in any case uh, like I say we could lose Bangladesh we could lose Florida we could lose a number of other places um, but it's not going to cover the earth Denver is safe Chicago is safe um, Loma Linda is probably safe too. We'll have beachfront property. Think about it. <laughs> anyway, so uh, yeah, I, I think we need to be careful about how we uh, how we use our our promises in 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 uh, evangelistic meetings, because I I think that while it may temporarily give us comforts, I think that in the end, people will find out later what the actual truth is and they will lose confidence in what they once had and I think that's that's not a good recipe for keeping people uh, uh, faithful to God you know when they find out that people in the name of God have lied to them and we come in here and then one there I think all the new land we will have we can build maybe a new nation in the Antarctic, where it's all, there's a continent there. And uh, there's in part of Greenland. Um, we had a lot of land there. So we may have another continent, build new, some new nations. Uh, well, yeah, if Greenland melts off, then you can grow stuff on Greenland too. That's true. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Obama, in a recent comment, uh, suggested that climate change is, the, is a great, much, much greater threat than ISIS. And uh, in addition, because 
we are using fossil fuels. And uh, the Pope is taking advantage of this by saying we have to push Sunday observance. Then we uh, save, uh, you know, fossils. We're going to less use of fossils. And uh, so he looks like he has convinced Obama, and if Hillary is elected, she is going to follow the same policy. Trump too. You could do it too. Trump too. Uh, Trump, uh, Trump is also in that, in that vein. Well, you know, it'll be interesting to see how uh, things unfold. Um, I'm, I am sure that uh, the hierarchy of the Catholic Church would appreciate having um, all Protestants kind of sort of uniting around a common Christianity and Sunday observance could be part of that. Uh, whether that will happen in our lifetime, I don't know. Uh, there was some movement in that general direction, interestingly enough, in the days of A.T. Jones, uh, who was our religious liberty secretary for a while. And uh, uh, that particular movement was averted. Um, maybe this one goes through. Maybe not. Uh, I think that we don't really understand all of the ways in which uh, the final events could unfold. And we may be surprised at how rapid they are. And my best example of that would be how fast communism in uh, Eastern Europe and even in the Soviet Union, which looked like it was going to be there forever, disappeared in about eight weeks in the first case and about two years later in the second. Um, if God wants something to happen, it will happen and it can happen very fast. And I was reading that uh, in a few years, China, China will be the greatest, the, the nation with the greatest number of Christians. It already is. It already is. Uh, and that's, that's a little stunning to most of us. Percentage-wise, of course, it isn't, but the thing of it is China is so big that there's a huge number of Christians in China. And of interest, uh, you, you think about it. If the army had not supported the government at Tiananmen Square, China would not be communist either. That's how close we came to having a virtually communist free world. So don't worry about those kinds of things. Those are in the hands of God, and he moves, and when he wants to move, things move. 